Hi everyone, good evening. Thanks for waiting. I think we'll go ahead and get started um, and hopefully others will just trickle in shortly. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Sarah Mazri. I'm joining you um, today from Toronto. Toronto is the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe Mississaugas and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been uh, coming into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship and respect. The dish or sometimes referred to as the bowl represents what is now um, Southern Ontario from the Great Lakes to Quebec and from Lake Simcoe into the United States. The idea is that we all eat out of the dish and all of us share this territory with only one spoon, meaning that we have the shared responsibility to make sure that the dish is never empty, um, which includes taking care of the land and the creatures that we share it with. And as someone who lives around the Great Lakes, my responsibility towards the indigenous people is to take good care of the land that um, I live on, and also to learn more about indigenous science, indigenous knowledge, and make space for it. Today, our speaker is Anna Sophia Barrows, who is the project coordinator, equity, diversity, and inclusion at the University of Toronto's Rotman School of Management. Um, she holds a Canadian certified inclusion professional designation, a CCIP, and has a multidisciplinary educational background in physics, leadership, and inclusion, and human resource management. She has coordinated multiple um, initiatives focused on advancing equity, diversity, and inclusion, and has, has spoken about the lack of diversity in STEM and academia, uh, privilege allyship in multiple channels, such as CBC's On the Money, CBC Radio, and multiple conferences and panels. Anna Sophia has written on how to avoid microaggressions in the workplace for publications such as the Canadian Science Policy Center and Latinos Magazine. So welcome to our Women in Space speaker series, Anna Sophia. I'm just gonna go ahead and make you host so that you can um, share your screen. Absolutely, thank you so, so much. Wonderful, just to confirm, can everyone see this correctly? Great. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, Hello, thank you so much, Sarah, for that fantastic introduction. Um, as Sarah mentioned, my name is Anna Sophia Barrows. Not Anna, not Sophia, Anna Sophia. Um, I try to go as ASB, just trying to kind of like put in the like AOC vibes in me. I'm Mexican, so I'm just like, maybe that's how I make it into politics. We'll see what happens. Um, I am the project coordinator, equity, diversity, and inclusion at the Rodman School of Management. Uh, I have a background in physics. I studied medical physics. And then seeing and experiencing firsthand the understanding the lack of diversity that exists in science, I started focusing my career a bit more towards equity, diversity, and inclusion, and ended up just full on deviating from science. And now uh, I am an, an inclusion practitioner and continue to be very uh, bonded to my scientific background and to the scientific community. And uh, I want to share the things that we do, for example, at the Rodman School of Management with the entire community, because I believe it's really essential in order to move um, North America forward. Uh, before we start, I want to share a bit about myself and I want to share about the land that I was born in. I was born in Monterrey, Nuevo León, Mexico. Uh, this land originally belonged to the Alazapas, the Huachichiles, the, the Coahuiltecos, the Borrados, who are known as the Chichimecas. I also believe that it's important for us, and thank you, Sarah, for doing that, to acknowledge the land that we're currently in. So right now I'm in, at, in Toronto, and the land that I am in, which also happens to be the land where the University of Toronto operates, um, for thousands of years has been traditional land, land to the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently to the Mississaugas of the, uh, the Kravik River. Today, this meeting place is still home to many indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and I am very grateful as a settler to be able to do work, live, and benefit from the land that I live in. One of the main things that we share in our office, the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Office, is that one of the reasons why it's important for us to acknowledge the land it's not just because it was one of the recommendations from the TRC. 
it's because it's super, super important for us to understand our history, understand the land we're in, understand as an, as an institution, it is essential for us to, if we're creating knowledge, to know what has come before us. And if we're sharing that knowledge, to make sure that we're representing the people, and especially the people whose land we're operating in, in order to include them. So today we're going to be chatting about allyship and how can we use allyship for better for better inclusion. And I want to share with you one of my absolutely favorite definitions of allyship. And this, def this definition was written by Roxanne Gay. This was written a few years ago. It's called, it's from an article from Mary Kay called On Black Lives Matters. And she, there she said, black people do not need allies. We need people to stand up and take on the problems born of oppression as their own without remove or distance. We need people to do this, even if we cannot, if they cannot fully understand what it's like to be oppressed for their sexuality, their gender, their ethnicity, their ability, their class, religion, or other marker of identity. We need people to use common sense to figure out how to participate in social justice. Don't tell us about your racist uncle, grandfather, or sister, or cousin. Don't try to unburden yourself of guilt that isn't yours to carry. Actively listen when marginalized people tell you about their oppression. Don't offer your pity, which only helps you. And don't apologize. Listen, listen to your best, listen your best to understand what it feels like to live with, a, to live with oppression as a constant. Speak up when you hear people making racist jo jokes. Speak up when you see injustice in action. Inform yourself about your local law enforcement and how they treat people of color. Vote. Take a stand instead of waiting for absolution of people of color. We don't have that kind of type. We are fighting. That is my absolutely most favorite definition of allyship because I really believe that it tackles many of the different issues that we tend to see when it comes to allyship. One of those first issues that I believe we have in terms of allyship, it's the fact that we believe we tend to self-appoint allyship as a title for ourselves. So it's really important for us to understand that allyship is not a self-appointed title. What does this mean? I do not to choose to call myself an ally. Someone else who might be coming or experiencing racism, sexism, or who might be experiencing any sort of oppression might be able to tell me if I am being a good ally in a certain situation. Another thing is that being an ally for a certain group, being an ally in a certain situation does not mean that we're an ally for all equity seeking groups. And we need to understand that it's ongoing work, it's ongoing, it's constant learning, it involves constant understanding. So when I start teaching uh, people what diversity means and why it's important to have diversity, the first thing we need to understand is that diversity is fluid. And by that, what I mean by that is that diversity is fluid in two different ways, as persons and as societies. Diversity is fluid in as persons because the way that we're born and how we, the identities that we're given at birth does not mean that are gonna be the identities that we stick to through the rest of our lives. We might change, things might change. And that's okay. And it's important for us to understand that we as selves are diverse. The second thing is that diversity as a society is fluid as well. And that means that throughout the years, things will change. Language will change. Right now, 2020 has been the clear explanation and the clear definition of that change. We have seen how in January, things were very different than now. And the problems that we're having in equity the problems that we're having in inclusion are very different than they were in 2019 and are probably very different than what they're going to be in 2021 or 10 years from now. So it's super important for us to understand that diversity and that fluidity and diversity. The second thing is that it's super important for us to understand that 
In places like Toronto, and I'm going to quote my boss, Professor Naman Ashraf, in places like Toronto, where we pride on diversity, if we are an organization, if we are a group, if we have any sort of group of people, we should not be taking pride just on being diverse because we're diverse by default. We need to take pride or being on being inclusive by design. And what did I mean by that? We have to make and take the steps towards being inclusive. And that takes education. And that means that we're gonna be uncomfortable at certain points. And that means that we have to move out of our comfort zones. It goes beyond Twitter. It goes beyond Instagram. It goes beyond any sort of social media. It goes beyond just writing an open ad. It goes beyond putting quotas on committees. It's work and it's ongoing work that we can all participate in. So today I'm gonna to share with you some of the strategies that I believe as allies, if you want to be striding as an ally and want people to acknowledge you as an ally, what are the strategies that we can take towards moving forward and helping create a culture of inclusion? So the first thing I would say, in order for us to be better allies, is that we need to check our privilege. We all have privilege. Just a simple fact that you're in this talk, able to listen to me, able to read my captions, able to participate, that's a huge privilege. And privilege comes in different ways, different forms, different everything. So we're gonna make things a bit different because I know that many of us have been like in Zoom calls all day or maybe class and it's tiring. So we're gonna roll up our sleeves a little bit and we're gonna talk about privilege. And what if we could buy privilege? Some of you, if you have been part of this activity before, fantastic, you can help moderate in your groups. So I'm gonna be separating you to different groups. I'm giving you a list of privilege. Each of these privileges costs $100. I'm gonna be sharing with you a document that has uh, the instructions of this activity as well, if you would like to have a more accessible um, version. Each of this privilege costs $100. I will separate you in groups, and as a group, you're going to be deciding what privileges you want to buy with the money that I assign to you. Now, in the list, in the document that I will be sending to all of you, there's going to be on the second page a list with the amount of money that you will be getting per group. So you're going to be assigned to a breakout group, that breaker group number is the number of the money that you will be assigned to, okay? And now, one of the key things that I want you when you're having these conversations to discuss is I want you to discuss why are certain privileges important to you? Why, are you, why do you believe some privileges should be bought over others? And I want you to actively listen as well what other people have to share because at the end, you will be sharing. So let's do this. Hello everyone, welcome back. I hope you had tons of fun. So I would like to request at least, let's say five of you to share your thoughts. So I want to share how it is that you came across choosing your privileges. Tell me what surprised you in any sort of like key thing that you got from sharing these privileges and understanding what they meant to the other folks in your groups. And you can raise your hand or I can volunteer you. So Lisa, would you like to share? Yes, but only because I think that ours was the easiest. So how much uh, money did you have? We had $100. Oh, okay. <laughs> And, and so we unanimously agreed that having a home would be the most important thing. And we um, were glad that we were not in a group with more money where we would actually have to debate the relative merits of those other things, because that would have been hard. Yeah, no, definitely. How did you feel about seeing that you got only $100? Well, at first, we were disappointed, I think, because... Um, Obviously, all of these things are important, mm -hmm. uh, but then not having to debate the relative merits amongst one another was 
also a, a tiny little bit of a relief. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Someone else? Well, I think it'd be interesting to share from our group because we were number 10. So we had all the money, <laughs> almost all the money. Um, and so it was an interesting, um, interesting to kind of think about it from the other perspective, I guess, of if, if we were to choose, and you know, it just was a kind of difficult conversation. If you were to choose two privileges that seem less relevant than the others. Um, so it was a little bit challenging to, uh, and, and it kind of speak, spoke to our own preferences a little bit, right? That, um, you know, one of the ones I suggested was maybe going to university or college, because if you have everything else going for you, maybe not having a degree, you'd still have a lot of other options. Um, we talked a little bit about being in a room and seeing others who look like you. Number nine, uh, again, if you're kind of, if you, if you have all these other privileges, maybe that's less important, but then, you know, some folks shared experiences where even with all this other privilege, that was still really challenging. Um, so I don't know, we didn't really come to a firm <laughs> decision. We mostly just talked about how difficult it was to choose. Yeah, no, yeah. for sure. For sure. Yeah, and it's it's very interesting because what I see, and this is a very common thing that I see whenever I give folks a lot of money, it becomes a lot harder to choose what you don't want. It's so much harder to give away privilege than to gain privilege. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Anyone else? You were all very happy with your privileges? I can share from our group as well. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. We, we were in a similar boat. We were group three and we had a thousand dollars and we were excited because we only had to eliminate two. And um, with the three of us, we could only agree on one, which was number one, people not being surprised if they realize you're intelligent, hardworking or honest. And it seemed like the other one that we were debating on was really informed by our own personal experiences. Um, and it just, it was interesting to see how everyone's um, personal experience um, changes what privilege they would want to give up. Yeah. No, for sure. Thank you so much for sharing. And then I want one more person to share or think about why it is that I gave you money. Uh, my name is T. Thank just you, T. in case you're wondering how you pronounce it. Um, it's a Vietnamese name, by the way. So Beautiful. It's it's spelled that way and really pronounced T. Okay. Um, we had $400 and I think choosing the first one was very much like the group that only had a hundred dollars. We very much all agreed fast on, yeah, we want a home. <laughs> um, I think we also chose that we wanted to, be able to afford adequate clothing for the weather mm -hmm. because we didn't want to freeze outdoors. And I think there was a lot of confusion with the last two. And so I'll tell you what we gravitated to. Yeah. We, we like number two, uh, counting your, you know, counting on your skin color and your cultural background. Mm -hmm. um, we also liked number um 12, understanding what everyone was saying, because that would be really cool to know about so many languages. Um, and um, I think we also, oh, number seven, we mm -hmm. wanted to, because we don't want to be in our house, but we also want to be safe when we're outside. Absolutely. Uh, um, Wonderful. And I think, did I forget anything? Uh, others who were in my, in my room? Well, and I, if I can comment to that, so you point out, this is the first time I hear this one and I love it, uh, for number 12 that you said, understanding what everyone is saying. So most people, when we read it, we think everyone else speaks a language that is not ours, but you went like a bit more inclusive even, which is understanding, thinking that everyone else might be speak, 
might speak a different language and be able to communicate with everyone, which is like a step ahead. I love that. That's so freaking fantastic. Oh um, no, I, I think that uh, when I'm in places like New York City and you're just walking down the street, you're hearing like four languages go on and that, and maybe I'm just a nosy person, but I wish I knew what they were saying. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I totally agree with you. I totally, totally agree with you. So just to move forward a little bit, I will answer my, my own question. Uh, why it is that I gave you money? So the reason why I gave you money is because privilege, one, we can be born with certain privileges, two, we can buy privilege. And the reason why I called, why, why this activity, I did not create this activity, but the reason why this activity is called privileges for sale and not white privileges for sale or cisgender privileges for sale or ableist privileges for sale, it's because privilege, the way we experience privilege can sometimes be linked to the way we experience oppression. The way we experience privilege can sometimes be linked to our intersectionality, right? So it is very important that when we're having these conversations, we try to understand privilege as a whole. We all have privilege in very different ways and pri certain privileges might mean different things for others. When I have with my students, when students in our faculty, when I chat with them, I make them understand that all of them are gonna be, or the majority of them are gonna be coming out with the same degree, but not everyone will be experiencing the same thing while going through that degree. That degree might mean different things, different challenges, different experiences while they're in school, right? It might mean more debt for some of them. It might mean more mental health challenges for some others. It might mean coming out of your comfort zone and learning about different cultures for others. It has a different perspective and that has to do with the way we experience things. So when we start acknowledging the fact that we all have privilege, we have different privilege and there's nothing wrong with having privilege. What is wrong is one, not sharing that privilege, two, letting that privilege where, and I'm gonna quote Professor Numan Ashraf, who I work for. He says that where we have privilege is where we have blind spots. So we need to understand our privilege in order to try to understand, and that goes to my next slide, which is our biases. Where do we jump to conclusions? So in order to be good allies, we need to understand our biases. And biases, understanding our um, implicit biases has become, and nowadays I just hear, it's a trendy thing to say on diversity and inclusion talks. Oh, you need to learn your biases. Oh, go do the Harvard implicit bias test. If you have not done it, you should do it. Um, oh, like you should just be aware of your biases. And it's so easy for all of us to say that. But what does that actually mean? So for me, and this is my personal experience and understanding, and I'm going to share with you how it is that I see of biases. So biases are our strong preferences. For me, sometimes I see biases where before I used to think of me being like, oh, I have a really good perception. I can like perceive how people are. I can perceive how like people react to certain things. And now throughout the years of experience that I have been having, uh, that I've had working in equity, diversity, and inclusion, I have come to the realization that those perceptions, those, that intuition that I used to take so much pride on are just biases. And I needed to challenge those. What I as an individual de do and continue to do for this is whenever I have an opinion about something that I know I may be going on my intuition to have an opinion or to share an opinion, I state, and this is a conversation that I had with my boss, very open being like, you know what? This is what I think, but I think this might be my biases talking. I need you to tell me what are your perceptions on this? What it is that you, like, what did you see? Am I being objective with what I see? Am I not being, and sometimes we need that extra help to have someone else that we can walk, and talk through these things. I have the same conversations with my husband. I have the same conversations with my sister. It is, biases are normal, 
but deciding and choosing not to acknowledge them is where, where the problem used to like usually lies. So in my opinion, on top of doing the implicit bias uh, test, we need to work on this every single day. And for anything that we, every sort of strong preference that we jump into, we need to understand that that comes from a bias that comes from an, our implicit brain talking to us. And we need to know how that can negatively affect our culture of inclusion. The third thing I would do in order to be a good ally is to avoid something. We need to avoid performative allyship. And I've been talking about this for years, telling everyone avoid performative allyship, avoid performative allyship, and people are like, what the heck do you mean by performative allyship? I think that this year has been the year that has shown a lot of people what performative allyship can look like. And I'm gonna give you a very simple example. With the Black Lives Matter movement, there was Blackout Tuesday, and a lot of people posted their black squares on Instagram. There's nothing wrong with doing that. I'm very supportive, I really believe. I had one of my best friends call me almost crying, saying that she started getting bullied from some of her folks because she did not post a black square. And she told me, I am calling you because you work in this field, but I have not done it because I am not active on social media. And for me, I have not been active enough to speak on behalf of this. I instead went and bought, she bought one of my favorite books that I recommended to her. The book, White Fragility. And decided that instead of posting something where she may not be as educated as she would want it, she was gonna learn. And I think that that's perfect. You do not need to just show that you're supportive. You need to act it. You need to embrace it. You need to embed it. There's no point of putting a black square on Instagram if you are not doing the work behind. I did not put a black square on Instagram, to be honest, because I did not go on Instagram that day and I was working, I worked 12 hours that day. And that does not mean that I was not supportive, right? Instagram, Twitter, social media is not the be all and all. I am gonna be very honest with you. I have colleagues, I have academics that I have known who call themselves equity, diversity, and inclusion um, advisors and advocates and all of that stuff. And here in Canada, they go and read the land acknowledgement. And if people have not bothered to put the effort of reading the recommendations from the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, Commission, sorry, there's no point of us just saying words if we do not understand where things are coming from. So we need to put the extra effort towards educating ourselves. It is important. And right now, I'm gonna be very honest with you. I'm so pleased that you're all, and I know that I may be preaching to the choir because all of you are here because you want to learn, but my office works with the mentality of training the trainer, training, educating the educator. You're going to go around and share this and it is super important for you to be realistic and to be okay with the fact that we are learners and learning takes time. So there's another book recommendation that I have for you. And this one is, I realized that I have it like super beat up. It's called The Person you mean to be. This is by um, Professor Dolly Chug. And this book talks about implicit biases. And it also talks about what it's like to be a goodish person. We do not have to be perfect. We do not have to be, not everyone needs to be an expert in diversity and inclusion to be inclusive. You do not have to feel like you are a good ally and put it on Instagram or in social media or anything like that if you're not putting the work behind. So I'm gonna share with you an ex a personal experience that happened to me. In order for you to understand why being a performative ally, ally can be problematic. So about five years ago, I got one of my first jobs coming out of my undergrad. 
and you can calculate how old I am. Actually, no, I'm probably older than you think. Um, I had a boss and a manager. There was a manager and a boss. And one of the managers, she needed help moving some stuff from one building to another. And her, my boss asked me if I could help her move the things from one building to another. And I was just like, yeah, absolutely. Um, I will be more than happy to do so. And the female manager said, ha ha ha, so you're gonna be my Mexican mule. So you're going to be my Mexican mule. I, so when I get anxious, I get red. I could feel my neck get red, my face get red. But this was one of my first jobs and I was in my first months of work. My boss response, who was there, his response was, oh, are you gonna let her call you that? So I laughed very nervously because I did not know what to do. I did not know what was the right thing to do at the time. Now, that was very problematic in many different ways. It was a very significant aggression. It was racist. It was just a complete bound of trust and everything. A couple of months ago, where when all of the organizations started writing their statements on how, why we care about anti-black racism, why we care about um, being more inclusive. This person, the dean of the faculty that I used to work at, sent a message on anti-racism. And I went and asked who wrote that message. And the person who called me a Mexican mule, her office was the one that wrote that message, the office that she runs. Performative allyship, right at its splendor. Someone can write a beautiful anti-racism statement and yet be a racist. And if that had happened the other way around, the trust that you break with the community might never be bonded again. And that's why we need to be super careful about performative allyship. We need to understand that it's a learning process. It's an iterative process. And now, here's the way that I try to encourage everyone to take the first step. After, on top of education, and in addition to education, I think we all need to be better bystanders. And we need to learn how to respond as bystanders. Because in that situation for the Mexican, like with the Mexican meal situation, I believe that I, what I needed was a good bystander who showed that they were there for me and that however I felt, it was true. And I was, I was allowed to feel bad. So when we're responding as a bystander, there are three ways that we can respond. And I'm gonna share the three of them. Because when we are bystanders, we all have different levels of comfort zone. Being a bystander and being a good active bystander is not a one way situation. We can all act as a bystander in a way that is comfortable for us and grow our level of comfort. That's fine, that's good. So now let's say I'm gonna put it in relation to my situation, my Mexican meal situation. The first thing that you can be as a bystander, the first D is that you can be direct. When you're direct, you can call out or you can call in. So you can either point out in the moment, you know what, this is not a right language or unpack it. Can you tell me more what you mean by that? Ideally, my boss, when he heard that this manager called me a Mexican mule, should have been, um, sorry, I." Do not fully understand if you're being racist or not. Are you trying to be funny? Because it's not. You can be direct like that. You don't have to be rude. You can just be direct. You can be assertive. But not all of us feel comfortable being direct. And depending on certain situations, we may not feel comfortable with that. So the second thing you can do is you can distract. 
in this situation, my manager could have moved the other manager to the side, be like, hey, Anna Sophia, let's go and chat. And then once we we're on the side, he could have asked me, I noticed this happened. How do you feel about it? How, what can I do to be supportive to you, right? Maybe talk to the manager on the side. So you can distract, you can separate the situation. You can either separate the people, you can change the conversation and then address it later. That might be the best thing to do. And the third thing, if you do not know how to work it out, you can delegate. And for this one, and I am putting myself here at your support, when you have a situation, it's not always expected that you know how to react to it. And you can approach people who might be able to do so. When you're sick, you go to the doctor, you delegate that situation, right? If you're seeing a problem with inequity, you can access someone or ask someone who has experience in equity, diversity, and inclusion. You can delegate the situation. You can ask your manager. You can contact me. In your, in your organization, if there's an office that works with, maybe it's the Office of uh, Sexual Violence Prevention, right? Maybe it's the Office of Anti-Harassment. Maybe it's the Office of, at the, at the University of Toronto, we have the Office of Anti-Racism and Cultural Diversity there are gonna be people who can support you. So now, if you are going into the basis of providing support, I wanna share with you one of my favorite ways of providing support. As you, if you are being the bystander, how can you have these conversations when something like this happens? And this comes from um, Farah Khan. She is, she runs the office of sexual violence and support and education at Ryerson University. And she says that when we're offering support, we need to be brave. And what she says is that when we are offering support, the first thing we need to do is we need to begin by listening. We need to listen to someone's concerns. Active listening. Do not speak on top of them. Do not speak on behalf of them. Listen to them. The second thing, it's to understand confidentiality. It, I have heard multiple, multiple times that situations where someone might come out to another person and then people just assume that it's public to everyone else and start sharing it around. When someone shares something personal to you, you have to respect confidentiality. People trust you enough to share these things. It's important to be confidential. Unless, of course, they're breaking the law, then that's a different story. Um, the third thing would be to ask that person what support looks like to them. We don't have to be superheroes. We don't have to be what we call, and sometimes we call it, and this comes a lot from, if you read the book, White Fragility, you would understand a little bit. We don't need to be white saviors. We don't need to be ableist saviors. We don't need to be, I don't need a, a man explaining me things. We need to ask people what support looks like to them. And this is a very interesting conversation that I have had with a lot of people. I was raised, and I think a lot of us are raised with the golden rule. Treat others the way that you want to be treated. My parents told me that I should, if I did not want to be treated a certain way, I should not treat people that way. But guess what? Not everyone wants to be treated the same. We are different. So the same thing goes when we are giving support. We should not give support the way that we wish people give, would give support to us in, that, in a certain situation because people might have different things. Some people might be coming to you to just vent about something. Some people might actually need help to move forward with a formal complaint or to get more support for mental health support. So you have to ask someone what it is that you can do to support them instead of moving ahead and supporting them right away. 
the fourth thing is that you need to validate them and you need to validate how they feel. When that manager called me a Mexican mule, I felt really bad. I felt like a bug. And I needed someone to tell me that it was okay for me to feel that way, right? Instead, I had my supervisor laughing, which what it did is the complete opposite. It did not validate how I felt. So once you show someone that how they feel, it's a valid way to feel, you can, sh you can start to empathize. And that's important. And not telling them that you feel sorry for them, but offering your support in the way that is most meaningful to them. So now that we have had this conversation, I really, what I wanna leave you with is I want you to understand that we all have different personal advantage. And we may also have advantage blindness, which comes from our privilege. What are you gonna do with this to start fostering inclusion? I am going to be very honest with you, working in an equity, diversity, and inclusion office, one of the best things that we get from students is students wanting us to be accountable. Holding us accountable, participating has been so important for us, right? Holding people accountable is a very fantastic way of doing it. Educating yourself. Another book, if, especially right now, another book I would absolutely recommend you is, I have all my books here, How to Be an Anti-Racist. Because the opposite of racist is not not racist. The opposite of racist needs to be anti-racism, right? And it's important for us to start embedding this in our lives. Same thing goes with any other group. We need to support others and we need to take ourselves account. We need to make ourselves accountable for that. So I want to thank you for spending this hour with me. I really hope that this was useful to you. I also, uh, I would very much appreciate your feedback. So if you wanna send me an email, if you wanna send me a tweet, um, Instagram, whatever you wanna do, I'm like super down to have coffee with you, well, eat online coffee with you. I'm very, well, not very flexible, I work, but I can make time to have coffee with you, continue the conversation. If you have any questions, feel free to share questions with me either if you want to type them out right now or if you want to unmute yourself and ask questions, I am very, very happy to answer them. We do have a few minutes for uh, Q&A, so if you'd like to write in the chat, I'd be happy to read them out or if you want to unmute yourself and ask your questions, please feel free to do so. or even if you disagree with things. Okay, I see someone raise their hand. MG, oh my God, I like lost it. So it was- Hi, Anna Sophia, can you hear me? Yes, this I can MG. hear you. Great, thank you for your presentation. Um, I have a question about uh, when you're supporting somebody and maybe like you said, they're venting or you're trying to identify what support looks like for them. Sometimes I struggle with being direct or knowing how to ask those questions. Do you have advice on how you can ask somebody what sort of support they're looking for in a situation like that? If maybe, yeah, you don't know how to bring it up. Yeah, absolutely. So, and I believe that a lot of that has to do with the way that you start building a relationship with someone, right? Um, the first thing, as I mentioned, the first thing I usually do, especially when we have persons with complaints or persons with who want to share any sort of concerns, they share their concern. And I just directly ask them like, this, it's, this is a very bad situation. How can we be supportive to you? What's the best way that we can be here for you? How can I be of support? It's a very simple way. And honestly, like, and I'm gonna be like very direct, like 
my my husband is one of the people that I like have these conversations with, right? And I just tell him like directly, like, are you venting or do you want me to give you advice? Like, just tell me. Um, so yeah, it depends. Like if you ask people, how can I be of best support? Or maybe after, like when you have a whole conversation, one of the things that we do for every single one of our meetings in our office, we ask people how our meetings were a good use of their time or how were they not. Because it's important to be clear about these things. It's important to have these expectations be clear and be established, right? So I don't know if that's a way, if that answers your question, but being direct is okay in these sort of situations. Great, thank you. Yes, that's super helpful. <laughs> no problem. Any other questions? Um, I see Lisa has a, land, uh, a hand up. Yes, Lisa, please, and thank you. Sorry, that was just up from before. I didn't put it down. My apologies. Oh, but thanks okay. for the presentation. <laughs> no worries. So I see here we had a question from Christine. I hope I'm pronouncing their name correctly. President Trump recently issued an executive order causing some employers to suspend diversity programs. Do you have any advice to U.S. researchers who may find themselves in workplaces that suddenly have dis discontinued programs to support diverse employees? Yes, I would have support for that. So, and this is a very, very, very unfortunate situation um, where a lot of it comes from trying to hold the organization accountable. We cannot always force people to do the right thing, right? So one other thing that we can do, and this is how in our office, how our office started, we had a committee, an equity, diversity, and inclusion committee, the, what we call the Ready Committee, the Rodman Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee. So, and that was years before our office got even existed. So maybe creating that sense of community where you can share these things is important, and that could be an easy, a, a simple way without a budget that you can start it. Um, Honestly, it's such an unfortunate situation. Like that's absolutely unfortunate and in my opinion, unacceptable. Um, so yeah, I hope that's helpful. The next question is, what do, you, what do you do when you feel like supporting one peer hurts another peer? <sighs> when supporting one peer helps another peer, hurts another peer. If you could elaborate a little bit more in what sense? Um, I, if, if this is something like, for example, if someone it's being, has a microaggression towards someone and what do you do about supporting one that might affect another person's career? Is that the this, this sort of question that we have here? Sorry for asking the follow-up. Um, but if that's the case, um, oh, that's okay. That's okay, Megan. No pro worries that the microphone's not working. Um, if that's the case, I will go in with my answer. Uh, if supporting one peer hurts another peer, um, I think that's a very tough situation. And I, I'm going to be very honest because this is one of the things that even years after like the Mexican meal situation happened, I still sometimes worry like, should I put in like a formal complaint about this? Like what should, and I work in this field, right? It's very, very tough because sometimes something so simple can cause, can destroy someone's career fully, right? And maybe that person changes or maybe not, right? So it's very important for us to try to understand the magnitude of the situation. As far as I know, the person that had, that made that comment to me has gone to training and like has all their stuff has happened. So they have had to like go through training and they're better apparently now. I hope that's the case. Um, but yeah, in those sort of situations, I would honestly try to get an objective eye that is outside of the situation. So sometimes like for example, for equity seeking folks, um, sorry, for equity diversity inclusion folks who work in the field, we, we are confidential. So it's kind of like a therapist. You can come and share with us your situations and we can help you assess the magnitude and what's the way of doing it. Um, and the best way to better support everyone because sometimes it's something that can be just like we can have a conversation and try to clarify things with the folks 
versus some others, it might be like if it's a sexual harassment complaint, we might actually need to proceed into investigating more, right? So it really depends on the situation. Uh, what I would ask and what I would do in those cases is I would be with like D uh, number three, D number three, delegate approach. And you can approach me if you want. I can like try to help. Um, but yeah, I would approach someone who's in the field who might be able to support him. That could be a good way. Um, I have another one. Hi, Ana Sofia. Thank you so much for this talk. It's got me thinking a lot. I'm part of the SA. C and A S chapter in my university. Would it be okay to share your privilege exercise with full credit to you? And uh, of course, of course, please. So I can even send you the link of where the original. So this or this um, activity originally came from a um, group of folks who created a, a project called the Safe Zone Project, and this was originally made for uh, the on LGBT privileges and. I have worked with community in furthering the privileges. I have a very long list of different privileges and depending on the group that I'm working with is the different privileges that I provide. So yeah, absolutely, make it your own. Like it's, uh, it's not copyrighted. So you can like absolutely use it, please do. And if you need help like running the session, let me know and I'm more than happy to support. Um, if there are no more questions, honestly, please stay in touch. Thank you so much for all of your attention. It has been so fantastic getting to talk to all of you. You are so great. I am very excited and I hope that we get to connect again in the future. Thank you.